We continue to look at the trial of Christ in John 19. In the first scene we come to, in verse 6, Pilate has just made a gambit. What, what's a gambit? Well, in chess, sometimes a player will advance a pawn to ask her a question about, uh, from his opponent. Do you want to take this piece? Pilate is offering a gambit to the crowd. Look, I've beaten Christ. Surely he's been talking a lot of something. Is not enough. But we see only whipping was not, not enough. Therefore, when the chief priest and officer saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It was enough for Jesus to only suffer. Jesus had to die. This was the law, as the Saint Andrew saw it. It was also the law, as God the Father saw it. It was enough. It was not enough to just send a prophet. It was not, not, not enough to, to send a, David. It was not enough to send Sol Solomon. Only his own son would be enough. And when his son came, it was to give life by offering his own. They accepted the gambit. There was no brakes on the car now. It was full speed ahead. Now they had completed their own trial. They wanted Pilate to finish it, the job they, they'd begun. They want Jesus dead. So Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault with him. As if to say, go ahead and do it. You do it. But they can't do it. Under Roman law, they were not allowed to do it. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die. Because he made himself the son of God. Now their claim is not true. True. Because Jesus was telling the truth. But they thought it was true. Even though they or their allies had seen the signs that Christ was indeed the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium, and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Now, Pilate is the governor of Judea. Why is he afraid? He's afraid of losing his office. He's afraid of making the wrong call, and by wrong, by making the wrong call, he saw wrong as the call that would have the worst consequences for him. So he went back to Jesus to try to get more information. But Jesus does not give him any more. Here we see Pilate's presumption. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Pilate was saying, how, how dare you not give me an answer? You are at my mercy. I am the one in charge. Cooperate. Now Jesus had not given a direct answer. Here Christ answered, answers, you could have no power at all against me unless they have to give, be given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Jesus says to Pilate, so to speak, you're in charge as much as my father says you're in charge. And government officials today should take this to heart. The government should be working for God trying to fulfill his purposes and his plans. Each one of us should consider it. Each one of us 
has been given opportunities to serve because God has arranged it. Now notice here also, there's no idea that all sins are created equal. Some folks will say, well, a sin's a sin. What's, why is murder worse than, uh, murder worse than what, what this other, other person did? The Judas, she says plainly, had the greater guilt. Betraying the Son of God, despite all that he had seen. Pilate comes on the scene well, for one day. And he is here trying to keep his job. When verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Now, if it had been up to Pilate alone, Jesus would have been, been dismissed. Pilate is under pressure. The, the Sanhedrin, the, the Pharisees, the chief priests, they want Pilate to know the emperor is going to hear about what you've done, one way or the other. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the, in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Gabbatha. Now Pilate's wife, in the background, John, John doesn't mention her, but Matthew does. He brings out an interesting, interesting de detail. The Pilate's wife had sent a message to Pilate, Pilate when he was sitting down here. She sent him a message and said, have nothing to do with that just man. I have suffered many things in a dream on account of him. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, verse 14, and about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, and again by the Jews we mean the, the Sanhedrin, the, the council, Behold your king. Earlier he said, Behold the man. As if he was saying, Once again, before I give my verdict, I want you to know, I don't find him guilty. And you can change your mind. And John makes note of the date, of the day, and the time. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Their determination is clear. Now, often it's, it's good to be, be determined. But here's a case where determination can, can be bad. When people are determined to do something wrong, Pilate gives them one more opportunity, and still they insist that they really want Jesus to die. And in saying this, they forgot Isaiah's proclamation. Isaiah 33, 22 said, The Lord is their king. Remember that when the judges had said, we won't, we won't be king over you? The Lord is king. Well, the same Hebrew had forgotten. Instead, they said, I have no kingdom but the one of this world. And people today still say that. They say, I have no vision for my soul except what I live in this world. I have no ambitions beyond what I, what I do in this world. I have no purpose beyond this life. That's so sad. But then Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified. He delivered him to be, them to be crucified 
And then they took Jesus and led him away. Pilate submits. Under pressure, he cracks. He allows the crucifixion to happen. And his own soldiers bear away Jesus. He, bearing his cross, went down to a place called the Place of a Skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Now John, as he's retelling the story, he practically overlooks the Via, Dol Via Dolorosa. I imagine that somebody could have said, wait a minute, John, where's your cinematographer? What about all the emotions that are trapped up in what happened then? But John does not want to play on his reader's emotions. John isn't writing to explain what crucifixion was and what it would involve, how painful it was. John is writing for people who are already familiar with, with the, the story he's telling. People who might already be familiar with the other Gospels. Simon of Cyrene, not mentioned. The woman who cried out about Jesus, not mentioned. Barabbas' release, not mentioned. What John says is simple. Jesus went out to go out there, bearing his cross. That cross that he bore was not just made of wood. What he bore was the burden for our, all our sins. It was a very, very heavy cross. And there, at Golgotha, they crucified him, and two others with, with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. The focus is on Christ, as he's condemned, as if he's just another criminal. But there's one more little detail that John mentions about Pilate. The recognition of Christ as King of the Jews. Verse 19. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. Now I imagine this was not Pilate personally, but Pilate ordering the inscription and having one of the soldiers nail, nail it up there. And the writing was, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. If you've ever seen a picture of, of the scene and seen the letters I-N-R-I on the cross, this is what it stands for. The words Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, but it's in Latin. They don't have J's in Latin. So the J and, and Jesus and the J in Jews become the I. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Rex of the Jews. And many of the Jews read the title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The, tr the, traditional, the traditional local language, the language of the marketplace, the, the uh, lingua, lingua franca, and also the Roman language. This was a message that Pilate wanted, wanted everyone to, be, to read. So, Verse 21, therefore the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am a king of the Jews. The inscription is supposed to state the criminal's crime, like murderer or rebel or blasphemer. Pilate here gives a great answer. Even though he had caved in under, under pressure, he still got a little bit of a mischievous streak. He does not want to be, appear to be intimidated too much. In verse 22, he answers, What I have written, I have written. Jesus was, was indeed sentenced, sentenced to die because he was the king of the Jews. Pilate is there for one day, and then he is off the stage. We don't know if he became a follower of Christ or not. But he had recognized that Jesus was innocent. And he knew that Jesus acted like some 
we had spiritual authority. Christ indeed died because he was the king of the Jews. He had come to offer the sacrifice that nobody else could make except him. And then we see a, a fulfillment of prophecy by Christ. John's spotlight is turning to Jesus. We don't see Pilate again. But on its way toward Jesus, it stops two times. Its first stop is at the Roman soldiers. And the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, they each shoulder apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. Now the soldiers don't know it. The soldiers, even though they're in the presence of a man who's dying, well, there are three men who are dying, that doesn't get in the way of the desire to gamble. They don't know it. But in doing so, they're fulfilling a prophecy of the, of the, about the Messiah. Just as Caiaphas, when he had said, it is expedient that one man should die for the people, said more than, more than he knew. Likewise, they were fulfilling prophecies without knowing it. And God often works this way in the scripture and in our own lives. What men meant were evil, God meant for good. The prophecy of fulfillment is a sign that God is still working. Jesus consciously fulfilled some prophecies, like when he entered Jerusalem on a donkey. The other, other folks fulfilled them without realizing it. In verse 24, then they said among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, for whose it shall be. The scripture may be, be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. That's a quotation that John makes from Psalm 22, verse 18. And then the camera stops a little close to Christ, focusing briefly on those who stand by three Marys and the beloved disciple. Now, they stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary, Mag Mag Mary Magdalene. There's Mary's mother, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, now the question often comes, who is Clopas? Uh, the Bible doesn't really tell us, but the tradition is that Clopas, that's the same, same guy who's Cleopas in Luke 24. Well, he was the father of Simon, who was Bishop of Jerusalem after James. And Clopas, or Cleopas, was a brother of Joseph, which would mean he's legally Jesus' uncle. John himself is also there. Verse 26. And Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by. He said to, him, to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Jesus was handing off care of his mother to the Apostle John. Now Mary had others who could, could have taken care of her, but John was chosen for that task. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Jesus entrusted Mary to be cared for by John. The tradition goes that Mary went with John to the city of Ephesus and died peacefully there. And there she was buried. And then the camera turns to Christ. After this, Jesus, 
knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Another prophecy for fulfillment. The fulfillment of Psalm 69, verses 19 through 21. That prophecy says, You know my, my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. I looked for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food. For my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Now a vessel full of sour wine was there, sitting there. And they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on his up, and put it to his mouth. Somebody, one of the soldiers, had compassion. Maybe. It's a is a flimsy plant. More like a big bush than a tree. Maybe this person was toying with Jesus, holding up the hyssop to be all around the edges, but never there at his lips. And only and intentionally put the sponge to, to Jesus' mouth. However it happened, everything that needed to be done was now done. The Messianic prophecies had been fulfilled. The character of the Father had been displayed. The character of fallen man had also been displayed. And so, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. The debt had been paid in full. <clears throat> the debt had been paid in full, and the Father's love had been fully revealed. And then, Jesus died, condemned by the world, condemned by the law, but not condemned by the Father. The law that condemned him was just a law as the Pharisees and the Sadducees saw it. They had the letter of the law, but not the Spirit. Christ came. Found worshippers who worship, worship him in spirit and in truth. And on the cross, after hanging there for hours, he did what he had come to do. To give his life as a ransom for many. That many can include you. If you're not yet a believer, you're in debt to God. Surrender to him. And you will not receive God's wrath. Because the cup of wrath for those who are surrendered to Christ has already been taken by Christ. Every drop. And to those, those who are surrendered to Him, He promises to make them reborn, made new spiritually. And God will sanctify each one of you and all of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help your people this week to be shaped by your hands, not by the pressures the world might put upon us. For you are our potter, or your clay. If your son was set apart from before the foundation of the world to, re to re reveal who you are, to show us your love for us, may it be our vision to act as vessels of your spirit, to share your love with each other, to share your love even with, with our enemies. As we have freely received forgiveness, may we freely give. In Jesus' name, amen.
we come now to the Lord's table. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and having given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This drink is all as you do it in remembrance of me. The service is now concluded. Go in peace.